By doing these exercises and being tested on a lie detector-like machine called the E-meter, they make sure you learn to follow exactly the teachings of Scientology's founder, L. Ron Hubbard. You can have a better life, they say, by following L. Ron Hubbard. Or maybe not. L. Ron Hubbard's son, Scientology's researcher, and other church officials have left the church, and now, for the first time, they are publicly saying that Hubbard is a liar, and the church's main interest is money. From the beginning, this was a fraud. Right, correct. Right. This man is L. Ron Hubbard, Jr., son of the founder of Scientology. He left the church in 1959. He's kept in contact with church members, but out of fear for himself and his family, he has kept silent. Now he feels he has to warn people. Your father never meant to help people to start a religion. He didn't believe it. He was just out to make money. Yeah, he meant, he meant to start a religion for uh, self-grandizement, for money, for power. Money and power. Mm -hmm. And he got that in great doses, both of them. Hubbard Jr. was there from the beginning when his father founded Scientology. He was second in command for 10 years. From the beginning, you were cheating people. You were telling them, this is a religion, we're going to help you. But the real purpose was to make money. Correct. How much money? Well, I knew up to 1959 when I left the organization, he was worth only uh, 20 or 30 million dollars personally. But uh, I have seen figures recently as much as a quarter billion. The church denies that Hubbard Sr. profited personally, but does admit the church is well off. Some of the money was raised through people like Andrea Schwartz. She enrolled students in Scientology courses. I would outline a program that pretty closely matched his savings account or matched what he could buy, you know, by getting a loan or whatever. And people would borrow money to take your course. Honey, people would sell their houses. They'd lie to their parents. They'd do just about anything they could. I would have died for Ron Hubbard. If I had gotten an order, this is what we need to do to make planet Earth a better place, I would have done it. But what do you find when you look carefully at Mr. Hubbard? Jerry Armstrong was so close to Hubbard, the church appointed him researcher for Hubbard's biography. He assembled thousands of documents on Hubbard, but when he read them... L. Ron Hubbard became a lie. In Scientology's text, Hubbard claims he miraculously cured himself of combat wounds. He was never wounded. He was never crippled. He was never blinded. He did spend some time under medical care for ulcers. 99% of what uh, my father has written and said about himself is totally untrue. He's just uh, made it up. Well, right. Profits from the bestseller went not to religion, says his son, but to the importing of drugs. We furnished the money. I went around, I went along to guard the money. Um, and uh, through uh, mafia friends of his, we imported uh, uh, cocaine and heroin through Columbia. Mm -hmm. People were giving you money to get happiness, religion, some learning, and you were going to Mexico and Colombia with your father to buy drugs, marijuana, and cocaine, correct? Then in England, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States, government agencies started investigating Hubbard and the church. Hubbard, however, never had to answer any questions because he moved Scientology's headquarters to this ship. And for five years, he ran the church from the ship. You were on the boat with him for four years. Mm -hmm. You got married on the boat. Right. He gave away my wife. He was the surrogate father of the bar. He... Exactly. Several church officials who were on the boat now say Hubbard used the boat to store millions of dollars. You would see it, help process it? Uh, I helped clear it through customs. Millions of dollars? Millions, in briefcases. Armstrong says in 1973, Hubbard went ashore to hide. And these pictures were taken of him in Queens, New York. The reason he fled the ship was because of a French fraud case. He grew his hair long as part of a disguise, and whenever he went out in public, he wore a little hat and uh, glasses. At the same time, he and his church launched an attack on his enemies. My father's basic policy had always been since at least since 1952, is called fair game, which means that uh, anybody that speaks out against Scientology, writes about Scientology, we would do everything in their power to destroy them. Like what? Uh, find out um, 
every mean, down, dirty thing that they ever did in their life and, and use it against them. It's an intelligence operation. An intelligence operation? Gathering information on who? On anyone who would oppose L. Ron Hubbard and his dream. The Scientologists had many techniques for harassing their enemies. In the late 1970s, they broke into the IRS and Justice Department to steal documents. Nine Scientology officers, including L. Ron Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue, were convicted for that break-in. Documents the FBI found in the church's Los Angeles office suggested other ways to harass an enemy. Order hundreds of dollars worth of liquor in his name and have it delivered to his home to cause him trouble. Wake him up every night on the phone and threatening him. Poison him while he's asleep so he'll never start another attack. Are these the policies of a church? The church provided two spokesmen, church lawyer Harvey Silverglate and Scientology International President Reverend Heber Jim. The church does not believe in that kind of a policy and has never held that kind of a policy. You're bound to have a few people who do not agree to the moral principles of the church. Who totally on their own go out and break into people's offices. On the other hand, what you're missing is that millions and millions of people follow the moral precepts, apply those, and have brought a tremendous amount of happiness to their own lives. You made it clear after the break-ins that this was not church policy. At some point, did you make it extra clear to everybody, hey, we don't break in? Correct. They've said that since about five minutes after my father created the policy. In 1950. The church says L. Ron Jr. is a liar and even signed an affidavit admitting it. He admits that he's lied about the church and he's lied in depositions, etc., and he wants to make a clean breast of it. L. Ron Jr. says he's no liar. He signed that statement, he says, only because the Scientologists threatened his family. These Scientologists say they were instructed to harass the church's current enemies, like attorney Mike Flynn. Flynn is an enemy because several ex-Scientologists hired him to sue the church. They broke into your office, stole 20,000 documents, uh, filed lawsuits all over the United States against me, um, sent postcards to me threatening to poison me. Um, I've had bomb threats called into my office, harassive telephone calls at all hours of the day and night. And how do the Scientologists find out what's happening in the enemy's camp? Through spies and double agents like Ford and Andrea Schwartz. What did you do? I spied. Ford Schwartz says Scientology's police organization, called the Guardian's Office, assigned him and his wife Andrea to pose as deprogrammers, people who help people get out of Scientology. The point of the operation was to become the enemy completely. So you'd have one of your own people leading the opposition? Absolutely. And what better way to play the game, playing both sides? You fooled Flynn. I penetrated the Michael Flynn network. He got you. He got me. Ford also spied on Hubbard Jr., provided data for this incredible document, a list of much of what Hubbard did or said over the past 30 years. That kept Hubbard Jr. too nervous to speak out. Probably the main thing that Ford Schwartz did was try to uh, keep me contained. And they've kept the media contained, too. The Sea Org is virtually Hubbard's exclusive navy. Each member of the Sea Organization signs a billion-year contract to serve Scientology. This is part of a news story on Scientology taped by ABC's San Francisco TV station KGO. The story never ran. You got a story killed at KGO. TV, yeah. Ford Schwartz, posing as a Scientology opponent, got KGO to let him see the story. He quickly told the Guardian's office that the report was critical. The Guardian's office threatened lawsuits, and the story was never broadcast. ABC says it wasn't newsworthy. Other stories have been killed. You got the UPI to kill a story on Scientology. Yeah. UPI reporter Todd Eastham was about to send out this story, which Andrea says is true, about how her fellow Scientologists had once beaten her up. The Guardian's office got Andrea to sign a statement calling the story a lie, and they threatened lawsuit. The story didn't run. My sources had been discredited to the extent that we no longer really considered them decent sources. And without Ford and Andrea Schwartz, there was no story. And Ford tricked the Reader's Digest. So when it ran an article on Scientology and said, for help in getting out of the cult, call these numbers, 
all the numbers led to Ford Schwartz. You were basically a cheat. Correct. I was basically a good con man. A cheat. How does the church answer these charges? Who can question what these people did? They said they did it. We have to assume that they did it. They said okay. their bosses told them to do it, that it's church policy. And if they policy. said somebody above them <clears throat> told them to do it, let's assume somebody above them told them to do it. And it's church and policy, them, they say. That's where we differ. Why are all these people saying these things? There are mixed motives. Money is really the crux of the whole thing. You have here people who, while they were in the church, committed acts, which they now, as ex-members, are testifying they did in order that they can collect money from the church, which they claim is responsible for what they did. That is, in a nutshell, what is happening here. Sounds like the whole church was there to make money. Jerry Armstrong said he shoveled millions of dollars to the ship and back. I think you're in this to get rich. Wow. Did, did he tell you what was done with that money? We have to answer to governments just like everybody else, and we file just like everybody else what the church makes and where those monies go. So who do you believe? Current church officials or people who've left the church? Pending lawsuits may bring out more of the truth. Meanwhile, those who speak out are afraid. I started to carry a weapon. I keep a knife with me at all times. I keep a, I sleep with a knife beside my bed. Because you think they might come and, and kill you because you have information that hurts them? I think they could. Fascinating. Do you think we'll ever know if Hubbard is alive at this moment? It's hard to say. Uh, we don't know if that tape is authentic or when it was made. If he is alive, his son's lawsuit may now force him to come forward and prove it. Millions of dollars are at stake. Meanwhile, tomorrow morning, Hubbard's wife will have her day in court. She's to be sentenced for that break-in at the IRS. Shades of Howard Hughes. It is. Thank you, John.